Hello, it's Scott Manley here. After an epic Chernobyl investigation, I am back to chilling out with some video games for a while, and conveniently enough, we have a new massive update to Kerbal Space Program. Actually, it's a paid DLC, but of course I got it for free because I bought the game very, very early. But yes, for your $15 or equivalent local currency, you get the Breaking Ground expansion, and it has like three major sides to it. So it's like, Two things which give you new stuff to do on surfaces. First of all, there are new surface features, and unlike the regular surface scatter, which we've all known and loved since the very earliest days, these are actually small discrete items on the surface which you can go up to and scan, such as this green sandstone. Now, it takes a special part. These are robot arms that you attach to various size of robots. There's three robot arms, incidentally. One's named after Curiosity, the other's named after Spirit, and the other is named after Opportunity. The biggest one is Opportunity because the size is clearly based upon how long they were operating on Mars. So the, the whole point of these discrete surface features is to give you a reason to build rovers. So rovers, of course, have been in the game for a long time. They're cool, you can drive them around, but there wasn't actually much point in building a rover because you it would be much easier to fly from one biome to the other. Whereas in this case, it now actually means that you need to have precision. You need to get within an object within a couple of meters and then stay still to actually scan it. Each planet and moon has its own collection of thematically appropriate features on the surface. You can have small little rocks that you can indeed pick up if you like. Or you can have things like this uh, cryovolcano. This uh, spout of ice coming out of the surface of Val, which looks very cool and makes you want to get out of your spacesuit and, you know, jump in and have a bath. Of course, this is, you know, frozen carbon dioxide, isn't it? And since we're on the subject of spacesuits, the expansion does give you another new suit for your uh, Kerbals. These look very much like the suit from The Martian, if you remember. It has this little camera hanging off the side. It, it's basically supposed to be a high-tech suit. If you remember, Making History came with like an old-school cosmonaut-type suit. And another thing that was added with Breaking Ground is surface experiments, which I am foolishly deploying at this point using Jebediah Kerman. Do not do this. Jebediah Kerman is a pilot and therefore is lousy at doing that engineering or science stuff. The way I see it, the surface experiments are designed to give you a reason to bring a full complement of three Kerbals. Because when you place the experiment with a scientist, it gets a massive boost to the amount of science. So this is the passive seismology experiment. And yes, it has very nice animation showing it getting set up, but it also has another cool thing that I'll talk about later. The surface experiments aren't regular parts. You put them inside uh, like storage containers and then the Kerbals can stick them in their inventory and then deploy them on the surface. And each you know, experiment setup, it requires power, it requires a controller, and it will also require potentially a transmitter to send data home. And the models and animations are some of the best that I've seen out of the, the game developers at this point. There's some cool animations and stuff like that going on here. I do actually like the mystery goo container, which just kind of pops up the mystery goo and then it has a camera pointed on the mystery goo so they can remotely watch the goo do its gooey thing. But that passive seismic experiment, that actually adds a gameplay reason to perform one of the classic Kerbal maneuvers, the crash. Because the passive si uh, seismic experiment, it collects data when you crash chunks of spacecraft next to it so that it can collect its seismic waves and unlock the mysteries of the internals of the moon. So now you can do more than just learn from your crashes. But perhaps the highest profile part of the expansion is the robotic parts. Now, Kerbal Space Program in the form of mods has had robotic parts for a while, so does the paid DLC deliver better robotics experience? Well, I think it does. I mean, obviously they've fixed the some of the floppier bits, but they've also got this really cool programmer which lets you sequence the parts. You basically move the parts and then create control points. 
And also as part of this, they've heavily expanded the action group system so you can now buy bind control axes to robotic positions. So say if you wanted to have a flap or a control surface that moved as you adjusted your pitch, you could do that. And the fun thing is apparently using the robotics uh, controller, you can take an input from a control axis into that and then use that to create like a full fly-by-wire system where you pulling the stick in one direction will adjust things in all sorts of cool ways. Or you can just try and build things from, you know, your favorite video games, such as this Vertibird from Fallout games. This is available on the Steam Workshop, so you can go and download other people's creations, and there are a lot of creations already out there. Such as this marvelous trebuchet, which launches an aircraft, which... <laughs> You know, of course, we've done this in the past in Kerbal Space Program, but now anybody can do it, assuming you have the DLC. Sure, somebody else may have built this, but the fancy flying you're going to see here is all me. Yeah, that's right, I managed to lose my entire tailplane system, which made for an interesting uh, set of flight mechanics. Turns out that this thing was only stable when the engine thrust vectoring was running at full power, which made flying it rather difficult. You know, it's one of these happy accidents that defines my Kerbal experience, is something goes wrong when I'm recording something, and I want to then try to challenge myself to solve it. So we've got a plane that has essentially lost its tailplanes, it still has your authority because it has these big jet engines that have fairly powerful um, your thrust vectoring but if you're gonna land then you need to throttle down and you, you lose your yaw stability so how do you land a plane in that situation I mean sure I could just bail out after all they do all have parachutes but that's not as much fun as repeatedly watching them die because I lose control no, I wanted to bring this back to the ground in as many pieces as po um, as, as fewer pieces as possible, sorry. Well, it turns out this thing actually has some fairly powerful engines that are able to... Well, they have a thrust-to-mass ratio of greater than 1, especially when you consider all that excess mass that I have dumped. So the trick was then to put it into a, like, a vertical position where it's not moving very quickly then the aerodynamics no longer matter and it's just a careful case of very gently bringing this down to the surface by sitting it on a tail on its tail. Well, wait, there's no tail left. But, you know, where the tail was? Sitting on the ghost of its tail, perhaps. And there we brought it back safely. Victory! And while a trebuchet is cool, this is a ballista launching a rocket, which is smaller than we'd normally be able to get to orbit, but with the extra boost that it provides getting it through the thick part of the atmosphere, this thing happily goes to space, well, after it destroys the launch pad. So while these new official robotics parts may indeed be less buggy and better supported than the unofficial mods uh, parts, I can assure you that the Kraken is still very much at home with these parts. So let's finish with something that I built all on my own. This is Virgin Galactic's Spaceship 2 and its carrier aircraft White Knight 2. This is my well, this is my interpretation of it. It uses the Mark II fuselage because we have to have the same size cockpit for both White Knight and for Spaceship 2. White Knight carries Spaceship 2 up to about 12,000 meters, then Spaceship True drops away, lights its rocket engine, and begins climbing for space. The real Spaceship 2 and White Knight are built by Virgin Galactic and the Spaceship Company, which is sort of a spin-off of scaled composites, so they use the same composite materials. The rocket motor is a hybrid rocket motor, but the coolest feature of Spaceship 2 that we can now do in Kerbal Space Program is the feathering system, or the wing feathering system, that yeah, to basically what it does is it takes the tail booms and it lifts them up like that so that the air spacecraft becomes passively stable in that uh, orientation. So, of course, they're now in a vertical climb. They've got several minutes of weightlessness. 
The tourists in the back are no doubt enjoying their moments of weightlessness. Perhaps some might be trying to see stars in the sky, which of course you won't be able to see because these launches will happen during daylight. But if you look straight down, you will see the airfield that you came from. But now on the way back down, the feathering system becomes very important because it stops the aircraft going into a nosedive and just picking up speed all the way down. It By presenting the bottom of the spacecraft, and using the wings to keep it stable, it slows it down to a subsonic speed so that then they can do, we restore the wings to the regular orientation and the spacecraft can pull out of the dive. It then becomes a glider and it begins heading home to the spaceport. Now this is obviously sped up by a factor of four so you can appreciate the approach. Uh, you know, this is obviously all done completely dead stick, even although there's no stick on these things. It's, yeah, never mind. Um, so yeah, the design for this, it just puts a single hinge inside the body to drive both of the wing, you know, the wing booms. In the original design I tested, I had separate hinges for both, but it turns out that it's easier to use a single hinge uh, because then you've got less mass, less drag, and drag is very important when you're trying to glide in towards a runway. This is uh, one of the harder things to do because uh, you know, the landing gear is still a little too bouncy. Would be nice if they would fix that sometime. But yes, that's my quick rundown of the expansion. Obviously, I've been playing it on Twitch TV when I get time between, you know, researching why nuclear reactors explode. It's a, I think it's a better expansion than making history, if you ask me. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe. <laughs>